From Burlington, Vermont, I'm Joshua Slocum, and this is Disaffected, the show where we talk about politics, culture, and relationships through a psychological lens. <laughs> this week, we're going to have some fun and some serious, as usual. I'm going to tell you a story about having a normal interaction with young people. Then we're going to take a look at the horrendous companion bills in Vermont, House Bill 89 and Senate Bill 37, which have passed uh, the Vermont Child Abduction and Mutilation Acts of 2023. And we're going to revisit a study from 1991 that talks about how boys who have what used to be called gender identity disorder, which is now called gender dysphoria, are extraordinarily likely to have mothers with borderline personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder features. Um, I want to put one bug in your mind, though. I want you to think of Rumble. Think of Disaffected on Rumble. We're going to get to the end here, and we are going to do Pupuli du Mokali as a Rumble exclusive. We are trying to shove you into Rumble a little bit. We're also going to be putting some content on there that will be Rumble exclusives, things that we cannot say on YouTube. Do you understand, don't you, that YouTube is going to, as soon as we get a little bit bigger, YouTube's going to try to shut us down. So I want you to remember rumble.com slash C slash disaffected. The other day, Kevin's in town, which is always a treat. So we, we got to work on the show together. He's actually in the other room right now, whereas ordinarily he's in an undisclosed and boring location in lower New York. Uh, so we went out to dinner at a working class middle American chain restaurant that you would recognize if I told you the name, but I'm not going to. We drive by and the lights are out. The, the marquee sign, the open sign, everything is out. Are they really open? Well, they said they were open on the phone. <clears throat> so we go. They are indeed open. We go in there. There's only two other tables seated there. It's a Friday night at nine o'clock. Very strange. So we're talking to ourselves, what, you know, how come the lights are off outside? And Kevin says, I'll bet, I'll bet somebody's trying to save money because of, uh, you know, low business volume, which, of course, if you're saving money by keeping the lights off, you're actually losing money because the business that you would generate from people seeing the sign and walking in the door would more than take up. But you see how it is. Anyway, so we get through our meal. We go outside when we're done and the staff are out there. Uh, one of the cooks one of the waitresses. It was the most normal thing ever. And we were asking them, what's the deal with the lights? And the guy, sure enough, says the manager decided he was going to save money by keeping the lights off, save on the electricity bill. No, no, it didn't occur to the manager that that is actually slowing business down, which you could use to pay to keep the lights on. Uh, so it was exactly what Kevin <laughs> said it was. Then they started telling us stories about how difficult it's been working in this industry food service since COVID. Guy's telling about a manager they used to have there, a, a female manager who would work the front counter, the coffee counter. And he, what did he say? Um, that she was out there at the front coffee counter twerking and putting her butt up in people's faces and talking about how, you know, I have an OnlyFans account. I have an OnlyFans account. <laughs> Do you know what he says? This guy's totally heterosexual. I, I swear to God, he says this. Yeah, I walked by and all I was getting from that was seafood. <laughs> so I said, well, maybe she should go on only fish. And then the waitress chick starts scream laughing. It was the most, nor it felt like 1991 at three in the morning after my shift at a Perkins restaurant. It was, and, and these young people had a work ethic. They talked about the fact they were like, yeah, some of the other people on shift, they'll just close the place if they think they don't have enough staff. He goes, when I'm here, I don't close anything. I'll do everything here. I'm here for the business. You could have knocked us over. It was awesome. Thank you, guys. I hope you actually made some money that shift, even if your lights were off. Turning to the White House and environmental justice. Did I? Yeah, no, I didn't skip anything. Okay, cool. So we're going to talk about environmental justice at the White House. <laughs> you know, President Biden's and, and Vice President Kamala Harris's poll numbers are absolutely in the toilet. She's hovering in the high 30s for an approval rating. He bounces around between about 40 and 44 percent. And recent polls, and it's not just it's not just a poll that you don't like. An NBC News poll showed that almost Three out of four Americans. Now, they weren't just polling Democrats or Republicans. They were polling likely voters. 
almost three out of four said that Biden should not run for a second time. But he's going to anyway. And if he wins, we'll never know why, will we? <laughs> so this is what we can look forward to more of, I assume, should there be a second Biden-Harris White House. Take a look at this on your screen. This is from the White House's website. Fact sheet. President Biden signs executive order to revitalize our nation's commitment to environmental justice for all. I'll read to you a little bit. President Biden and Vice President Harris believe that every person has a right to breathe clean air, drink clean water, and live in a healthy community now and into the future. During his first week in office, President Biden launched the most ambitious environmental agenda, justice agenda in our nation's history. To continue delivering on that vision, today the president will sign an executive order further embedding environmental justice into the work of federal, federal agencies to achieve real, measurable progress that communities can count on. The entire purpose of this, and this thing is long, like you scroll through, it's like six or seven pages in 10 point type, okay? The entire purpose of this is feel, blad, feel bad for black people. Anything that hurts people, black people have it worse. Feel bad for black people and pat us on the back for feeling bad for black people in public. That's the entire purpose of this. Let's go. First quote, for far too long, Communities across our country have faced persistent environmental injustice through toxic pollution, underinvestment in infrastructure and critical services, and other disproportionate environmental harms, often due to a legacy of racial discrimination, including redlining. Black people have it the worstest, you guys. Just have it the worstest. I mean, let us remind you of racist loan practices that totally haven't happened in, like, decades. But we're just going to say it because, like, if we say redlining, you'll be like, oh, my God. That's why none of them can get a job because their grandparents are redlined. <gasps> Next quote. <clears throat> With this action... The president is working to ensure that all people, regardless of race, background, income, ability, tribal affiliation, or zip code, can benefit from the vital safeguards enshrined in our nation's foundational environmental and civil rights law. So what will this executive order do specifically? <laughs> you didn't think they're going to tell you, did you? I'll just give you the headlines from the bullet points. It will deepen the Biden-Harris administration's whole of government commitment to environmental justice. We're going to do some li linguistics here. Remember I talk about linguistic uniforms here, how everybody has to say the same things and they have to say words this, down to the pronunciation, right down to the pronunciation, you know, community, didn't, important. <laughs> We have to have new bureaucratic terms, whole of government. They even they got the proper parentheses in there to show that it was a connected phrase. Whole of government commitment. It's like top of mind and suckle back. The, um, the executive order will also better protect overburdened com communities from pollution and environmental harms. I thought it said protect them from environmental laws. <laughs> It will also strengthen engagement with communities and mobilize federal agencies to confront existing and legacy barriers and injustices. Little more. This won't be on your screen. I'll just read it to you. Communities with environmental justice concerns have long experienced exclusion and other significant barriers to having a voice in federal decision making. The executive order recognizes this reality and that racism is a fundamental driver of environmental injustice. It directs agencies to actively facilitate meaningful public participation and just treatment of all people in agency decision making. The executive order also underscores the vital importance of tribal consultation and coordination, including to strengthen nation-to-nation -nation relationships on issues involving environmental justice. Nation-to-nation, -nation. isn't that cute? Isn't that cute, the United States and the Mohawk Nation, for example? <laughs> More things that it will do. 
expand interagency coordination and launch a new Office of Environmental Justice within the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Of course, it's going to launch a new office. It will then increase accountability and transparency in federal environmental justice policy. It will also you know, honor and build on the foundation of ongoing environment. I can just hearing this in Kamala Harris's voice. In this moment in time, together, as we speak and honor, in the present moment, as it passes from this moment in time, including tomorrow's moments. <laughs> <laughs> Under the executive order, agencies will continue their efforts to advance environmental justice in ways that complement and deepen prior work. Shivers. It does two more things. Well, it does many more than two more things, but I'm not trying to lose audience members here, so I'm only going to give you two more. The executive order uses the term disproportionate and adverse, that's not a term, it's two terms, as a simpler, modernized version of the phrase disproportionately high and adverse. All right, this is their fetishism with language. I'm gonna start it over again. I want you to listen to this carefully. The executive order uses the term disproportionate and adverse as a simpler, modernized version of the phrase disproportionately high and adverse, used in Executive Order 12898, which everyone knows by heart. Those phrases have the same meaning, but removing the word high eliminates potential misunderstanding that agencies should only be considering large disproportionate effects. We're gonna find all the racisms, even the little ones. And finally, announcing the justice for a initiative. Through the Justice for the Initiative, the Biden Harris administration is reshaping hundreds of federal programs to ensure that 40% of the overall benefits of certain federal investments flow to disadvantaged communities. Today, three additional agencies, the Department of Commerce, the National Science Foundation and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, otherwise known as NASA, announced their Justice 40 covered programs. Now, nearly 470 programs against 19 federal agencies are covered under the president's Justice 40 initiative. Justice 40. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, grilled cheese girl. Uh, and in this segment, finally. Yeah, we're just, we're doing it. Um, we're doing this rapid cycling bipolar style. We are going from funny to shitty and back and forth. Here's a tweet from Billboard Chris. Billboard Chris is the nom du campaign of Chris Elston, a father from Canada. We've had him on the show. He's a very brave man. He travels around North America on his own dime wearing a sandwich board, a literal sandwich board that says things like no child can consent to uh, transgender surgery, uh, don't give kids puberty blockers. He's trying to stop this mutilation of children that we call gender affirming care, which is just a modern euphemism for an older euphemism, which is sex change surgeries on kids. That's, that's what this is. So his tweet lets us know something interesting about an 18-year-old boy who died when he was having his faux vagina constructed. This is from the Post Millennial. And what's important to understand here, you're going to hear it, but I need to underscore it for you so that you understand it. What's called the Dutch Protocol, which Europe is abandoning now. Europe is dialing back on trans and kids. They're realizing belatedly that this was all baloney, that it was all mutilation, and that the claims that this improves mental health outcomes, that this quote saves lives, not only aren't true, but the opposite of those claims is what's true. And you, we, we actually didn't need studies for this. This is another example. So you don't need, don't, don't say, where's the, what's it, where's the study? Where's the peer review? Stop it. 
You don't need a study to understand that the way to treat mental illness is not to slice off healthy body parts and to tell the mentally ill person that she is indeed Marie Curie, just like she believes she is. But that's what we do when we use the word trans. The Dutch protocol of early intervention puberty blockers so that kids won't develop the wrong puberty so they can have better cosmetic outcomes when you trans them. This death occurred in the very Dutch study that was used to promote this surgery on children, okay? So even though a participant in this study died from this, this study was used to give us the safe and effective Dutch protocol. From the Daily, not Daily Mail, I am sorry, Libby, <laughs> the post-millennial. A 2016 medical article documenting the tragic death of one of the participants in the linchpin Dutch study upon which the entire child sex change experiment is based indicates that puberty suppression was to blame for the young person's death. The case is that of an 18-year-old trans-identified male whose puberty was blocked by the Dutch researchers at a very early stage, meaning there wasn't enough penile tissue for surgeons to use to create a neo-vagina. Therefore, a more risky procedure used a section of the patient's bowel was necessary, which resulted in fatal necrotizing fasciitis. Let me translate for you. Fatal necrotizing fasciitis? That's the skin rotting. That's the skin, that's part of your body turning into a corpse. Stinking purple yellow rot. Okay? Quote, the patient is described as being a quote, healthy 18 year old for whom standard vaginoplasty surgery was quote, not feasible due to having undeveloped genitals as a result of early puberty, supp puberty suppression. You know, this is what has happened to that kid, Jazz Jennings, right? Long running TLC show, I Am Jazz, that poor tortured boy who was puberty blocked before his penis grew during puberty. So he ended up with a micro penis, which his mother talked about on national television. And so they had to make his rot pocket, his vagina out of pieces of his colon tissue and he complained that it stinks like what feces yes do you know that do you understand that so-called sex changes are merely creating a pocket a flesh pocket it's not a vagina it's not connected to any organs it does not go anywhere it hits it hits a skin wall okay it's just a flesh pocket and when you make it out of bowel tissue, it's going to smell like bowel tissue. Yeah. Guess what else? Quote, transgender women, says the study, with early onset gender dysphoria treated with puberty suppressing hormones report fewer behavioral and emotional problems and an improvement of general functioning, readers are assured. <laughs> Final quote, once again, after this harrowing account of a young person's needless death, the researchers assure the reader that, quote, vaginal reconstruction has a, quote, positive influence on the quality of life of non-transgender and transgender women, but cautions that physicians and patients need to be aware of serious complications that may arise. Do you know where that necrotizing fasciitis came from? It came from the colon that they used. And do you know what in the colon made it do that? E. coli. Yeah. Bon appetit. See you after the break. Can't get enough of our love, baby? That's because you're not subscribed. Move that thumb over to the great big old subscribe button on your podcast app so you never miss an episode. We put out audio only exclusive content that you won't get on any other video platform. So make sure you subscribe today. Looking for a non woke place to put your money where your mouth is? Put it where my mouth is. Disaffected supporters get access to our private Discord chat server, backstage episode recording sessions, surprise guests, and more. And all it takes is $10 a month. 
you've got two options. Either Substack, visit us at disaffectedpod.substack.com or go over to subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Remember, choose the $10 level or higher for Discord access. Welcome back. In earlier shows, we've told you about what's going on with Vermont House Bill 89 and Senate Bill 37. These are what I call the Vermont Child Abduction and Mutilation Acts of 2023. What they do is make Vermont into a so-called trans sanctuary state. And, And much, much worse. Here's a rundown of what these two bills will do. Now, they have both passed the House and Senate and they are awaiting the governor's signature here in Vermont, our passive and henpecked Republican in name only governor, Phil Scott, will certainly sign these bills. He cannot be counted on to stop the abuse of children. Thank you, Governor Scott. In summary, these two bills together. First, <clears throat> they make sex changes a legally protected health care activity. That's a term of art in this legislation. They make sex changes an explicit right under Vermont state law. It says so right in the bill. This is a right in the state of Vermont. Violates these bills violate the Constitution by barring Vermont courts from cooperating with out-of-state courts if the issue is transing a child. Now, they've mixed this up with abortion. They've done this deliberately. They've put this gender affirming care guarantees into the same section of Vermont law that deals with reproductive health and abortion. Why did they do this? So that no one would feel able to say no, because in Vermont, it is so liberal here that even many Republicans can be emotionally activated by what they perceive to be threats to abortion. That's why they put that in here. No one is going to challenge it. Even if children have to be sacrificed, that is okay even if older children have to be sacrificed. That's, that is an acceptable price to pay, okay? Um, these bills also prohibit courts and state agencies from cooperating with a summons or extradition or information order from an outside court outside the state if the outside state is trying to stop the transing of a child. Also, these bills call any attempt to stop the transitioning of a child abusive litigation. That's a quote. That's a term, direct term. It gives a parent or any adult the right to bring a child into the state of Vermont to trans them with no fear of extradition, even if the adult is wanted, legally wanted in another state over this issue. It gives a parent the right to sue the other parent for trying to stop the transing of the child. Yeah. Finally, these bills require health insurance companies to pay for sex change surgeries, including those on children. It bars malpractice insurance companies from adjusting their premiums, raising their premiums for doctors who perform sex changes, even if the insurance companies risk an actuarial tables show a higher likelihood of having to pay out of being sued. Even if that's the case, this law bars them from adjusting their rates. They would they call charging rates based on risk, which is the entire model of how the insurance industry works. They call that discrimination in this law. So you can't do that. Mm-hmm. It requires these bills require all state colleges in Vermont to have what they call a readiness plan to give students, quote, gender affirming care and access to reproductive health, including abortions. There's so much more to these bills, but these are the basics and they are bad enough. And I've written something. I've written actually a primer and you will be able to download it. It's public uh, for everybody. I've written a primer on these bills and I've taken all of the language and put it into straight, comprehensible, plain English so that any adult who can read can understand the actual effect of these bills. Uh, To find that document, just look at the notes, the show notes that are underneath this on whatever video platform you're watching. It's a Google document. You do not need a password. All you need to do is link it. Yes, it is a public document. Yes, I intend it to be shared. Yes, you may download it. Yes, you may make a version of your own and crib from it. Do whatever you like with it. I hope it's helpful. 
Um, <clears throat> you need to be watching your state legislature, all of you, wherever you are right now, even if you're out of the country. I mean, I know it's different. You have different legal systems, but this stuff is taking... It's taking over the West. You need to be watching your state legislatures, especially if you are in a blue state, because this is happening. This is not just Vermont. Minnesota just passed a similar law. Washington state just passed a similar law. Other Democrat-led states are jumping on this bandwagon to be trans sanctuary states. Do you live in a blue state? If you do, have you been checking your state legislature's website? Has it occurred to you? Probably not. Most people don't. I'm asking for it to occur to you. Please learn how to look for bills. Learn how to search for terms like gender affirming care. Know what is coming down the pike in your legislature is if you don't, it's going to pass before you even have a chance to object to it. And sadly, it's going to pass in a lot of these states anyway. There is going to be more suffering and death. That is certain to happen. It's 100 percent guaranteed. I'm sorry to tell you that, but more children are going to be hurt. OK. Um, I do want to say on these two bills here in Vermont, the first time around, I can't remember exactly, but most, if not maybe even all of the Republican dele delegation voted in favor of one of these bills because they didn't know what they were reading and they were told, and I know this because I've talked to people who are involved in this, they were told, oh, it's just, it's just protecting stuff. It's just for health. It's for health and safety. It's not doing anything bad. Now, I don't let those Republicans off the hook for believing that baloney. If you've been in the legislature, you understand how this works. You actually need to read the laws before you vote on them. That's your moral duty. But this time, I want to say thank you to 22 of the 24 Republicans who changed their vote and voted no. I don't know what persuaded the other two Republicans to vote yes for this, but I would say to them, do you know what you're voting for? Do you actually understand what you're voting for? <sighs> All right, let's move on to Montana. All troon all the time. Let's talk about Zoe Zephyr. Zoe Zephyr is a transgender woman who's a state lawmaker. It's like the first state lawmaker in Montana openly transgender. And we have to say the first openly transgender because we have to linguistically pretend that there's some chance that a man dressed up as a woman did it before, but nobody knew because he didn't tell. <laughs> this is so freaking dumb. <laughs> so, Zoe Zephyr. The first openly transgender woman state legislator in the state of Montana um, got they self censured um, uh, censured for. Well, we're going to show you the clip. I guess I shouldn't spoil it. Take a look at this picture, though. Uh, can we put that up on the screen? Yeah, that one. Mm hmm. Yeah, this is Zoe Zephyr. Um, did a mic job? Just did a mic job. I mean, look at that bold and powerful woman. All right. Do you want to hear what this velociraptor sounds like? Let's play the clip, please. We need access to the medical care that saves our lives. And these are hollow words coming from someone whose amendments are going to make it harder to access that care. The bill says it does not prohibit social affirmations. That's not necessarily too true. It prohibits the use of state buildings for advocating for or allowing a social transitioning. Um, it says that it allows the access to psychotherapy that treat Montanans struggling with their gender identity. If you disallow the use of the medical care that is accepted by every major medical association, if you disallow that care, and don't allow people to, to have access to that. The only therapy left is either A, meaningless, or B, conversion therapy, which is torture. And then the only thing I will say is if, I, if you vote yes on this bill and yes on these amendments, I hope the next time there's an invocation, when you bow your heads in prayer, you see the blood on your hands. Um, so I hope that if you vote on this again, you see the blood on your hands. <laughs> hey, what? All right. 
you want to stay safe from lizards like this, you got to you got to be still. See, their eyes work on motion. And if you hold really, really still, they can't see you. <laughs> the fake, fake woman voice, the breathy fake wine voice. She sounds like she's exhausted. And I'm only saying she for the humor value because that's an obvious man. Uh, he calls psychotherapy and talk therapy, just talking to a therapist, conversion therapy, which is torture. Mm hmm. <laughs> He's been martyring himself up. Over. That's what got him censured, that you will have blood on your hands. They were like, no, I'm sorry, that's against the rules. You do not accuse your fellow lawmakers of participating in murder. But it was really just because she's transgender they don't want her to speak. So here's a picture from Zoe Zephyr's Twitter showing Zoe Zephyr sitting on what appears to be a Naugahyde couch, how appropriate, leatherette. Um, <laughs> with a TV tray, TV dinner tray <laughs> in front of him um, while he, you know, looks at paperwork. Do you see me paperworking? Here's what the tweet says. Though they initially tried to have me removed from the public seating area, I am here working on behalf of my constituents as best I can, given the undemocratic circumstances. I'm talking to legislators, listening to debate, voting on bills, and fighting for democracy. <laughs> <laughs> so who is Zoe Zephyr, really? Well, according to MontanaTalks.com, which is the online home of a conservative talk radio station in Montana, this is who Zoe Zephyr is. I'll read you a little bit. Zephyr was born Zachary Rash in Billings, Montana, and grew up there and in Washington State, where he was a champion high school wrestler. <laughs> the media has been so negligent in their vetting of Zephyr that, as far as I'm aware, this is the first time his birth name has been publicly revealed in an article. Zui Zephyr currently in the state and national headlines did not even exist until 2019. When, after several months of taking female hormones, whole several months, Rash publicly transitioned. He had surgical vaginoplasty in 2022. Indeed, he was not in Missoula on election night when he was elected to the Montana House, but flying to New York for post-operative care of the permanent wound where his natural genitals used to be. That's not me, folks. That is the article. He seems to have had a number of marketing jobs in Seattle before moving to Missoula, getting involved in the activist community and working at where? The University of Montana, naturally. Uh, Jeremy Carl on Twitter has more about this, and we'll show you his tweet here. He says, transgender identifying House member Zoe Zephyr became a media celebrity when he accused the Montana GOP of, quote, having blood on their hands after passing a bill to block genital and hormonal mutilation of children. Yes, again, stopping children from being surgically mutilated is called abusive, gory, and bloody. Reversal. This is cluster B. This is the thesis of this show. This is pathological narcissism. It's cloud cuckoo land. It's through the looking glass. Black is white, up is down, bitter is sweet. Love is abuse, abuse is love. Just reverse everything. So here's, can we put that picture back up of, of the two of, of Zoe Zachary, please? Yeah, take a look at that. Here's, you know, here he is velociraptoring. And there he is a few years ago, just looking like this sort of, like kind of a sketchy dude, right? But just a dude. Um, yeah, yeah, they they really do have a problem vetting these people. Because he, here's something from Zoe Zephyr's Twitter. Take a look at your screen here. It's a comic book style drawing of a clearly eroticized male and female couple, exaggerated secondary sex characteristics. You know, she's she's got huge tits and, and a big ass. He's all muscular and, you know, this, that, and the other thing. Um, and the picture shows the female character 
basically sexually riding on top of the guy. And here's here's what Zooey Zephyr had to say as Zooey Zephyr in public. This is my ideal relationship with a man, one where I'm riding him and also ready to end his life. Oh, honey. <laughs> Put the lotion in the basket. Finally, on to Minnesota Troonery. This is Minnesota Troon Lee Finky, who wants to make pedophilia a protected sexual orientation, just like being straight or gay. Uh, this comes from foxnews.com. Here's Mr. Finky. Take a look at him here. Pretty, pretty. No oh, boof at all. Current Minnesota law defines sexual orientation. As most laws do, it, it has an actual definition of sexual orientation. That definition under current law excludes pedophilia explicitly. It says this does not include pedophilia, sexual attraction to children. Mr. Finke has just introduced what he calls the Take Pride Act. And that act strikes out the language in current law that excludes pedophilia from the definition of sexual orientation. So th the sentence says, you know, this does not include sexual attraction to children. His law strikes that sentence out, which means there's no longer a direct prohibition on including pedophiles under sexual orientation. You understand you're with me so far, right? Well, like all narcissistic abusers, Mr. Finke lies about the effect of this and actually does a complete reversal. This is a top quality cluster B move. Quote, nothing in this bill changes or weakens any crimes against children or the state's ability to prosecute those who break the law. Of course, pedophilia is not a sexual orientation. The language never should have been included in the statutory definition in the first place. Crimes against children are located in Minnesota's criminal statutes. And again, they remain unchanged. This is a lie. There is no reason to remove that language except because you want pedophilia to be included in the definition of sexual orientation. There is no motivation for this, none, none, except to inch pedophilia toward the status of a protected and cherished characteristic. Do you see how he's trying to claim that he's against pedophilia and that he was in he was offended that the, the term pedophilia was even located near something talking about sexual orientation It was just inappropriate. He's against he's against it. He's not. If he were against pedophilia in principle, he would not specifically strike a statement that was inserted deliberately to make sure that everyone who read the law knew that you could not claim that your sexual attraction to diddling children was a protected sexual orientation. No, 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 Mr. Finke, I can see what you're doing and it is only my hope that everybody else can see what you're doing. Okay, we are coming up to a break here, but I would like to ask for your help. Will you join as a member and support this show? We don't have advertisers. YouTube will not monetize us. Do you understand that the reason why we have no commercials on YouTube to interrupt your listening and viewing experience is because YouTube will not allow us. We are too controversial. And of course, at some point we'll be shut down. We don't have advertisers. We don't have sponsors. We don't even have YouTube ad money. We only have you, the audience. If you get value out of this, and I hope you do, because we try to bring you actual value, comedic value, but also political value, will you please help pay for it? There's two ways to do it. You can go to Substack or Subscribestar. Substack, I think, is a really fine option. Um, but then again, so is Subscribestar, because I put up the same premium content there, and that's what you get when you join. So go to disaffectedpod.substack.com or go to subscribestar.com. And if you sign up as a paying subscriber, you get access to our private Discord. It's just chat rooms, but only for disaffectants. And that's what I call the fans of this show. You are disaffectants. But there's almost 400 people in there. We've got topic areas on all sorts of different stuff. Um, you don't get banned for calling men, men and women, women. And you also get invited to our Zoom watch parties. And right now we are going through the eight part miniseries Feud, Betty and Joan. Episode three is coming up. So we'd love to join you again. 
we'd love to have you join us and we'll join you too. Disaffectedpod.substack.com or subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Can't get enough of our love, baby? That's because you're not subscribed. Move that thumb over to the great big old subscribe button on your podcast app so you never miss an episode. We put out audio-only exclusive content that you won't get on any other video platform, so make sure you subscribe today. Looking for a non-woke place to put your money where your mouth is? Put it where my mouth is. Disaffected supporters get access to our private Discord chat server, backstage episode recording sessions, surprise guests, and more, and all it takes is $10 a month. You've got two options. Either Substack, visit us at disaffectedpod.substack.com, or go over to subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Remember, choose the $10 level or higher for Discord access. The reason I'm not clean shaven this week is because I'm doing a favor for Glod, which is gorgeous ladies of Discord. There's a couple of ladies up in my Discord who just really, really wanted to see what I looked like with beard growth. This is for you. It's not actually. I mean, I hope you like it. But I got up this morning and realized I didn't have any sharp razors and I was not going to cut my face just for you all, just so I could look like, you know, I should have done that, though, so I could really martyr it up. Just come in here all bloody, maybe put a crown of thorns on. Maybe that way you'll subscribe and pay, huh? (laughs) Right. I'm going to tell you a story from my childhood. Several stories. When I was six years old, I wanted to go as the Wicked Witch of the West for Halloween. I know that those of you who are loyal viewers have heard this story before, but some of you have not. I wanted to go as the Wicked Witch of the West, and my mother freaked out. And for those of you who are not familiar with my mother, <laughs> that's a drinking game on here. Every time I say my mother, take a shot. My mother was a cross between Joan Crawford and, and uh, um, the religious fanatic mother from Carrie. So my mother has borderline and narcissistic personality disorders. Very unstable, very volatile, very anxiety ridden. And she was extremely anxiety ridden about my growing tendency as a boy to want to dress up as a girl. And she freaked out when I wanted to be the witch for Halloween. You can't do that. Boys don't. Boys, why can't you just be a wizard? And strangely, her, she, I mean, when I'm imitating her, I'm, I'm doing it accurately. I mean, that was the kind of affect that my mother had when she would spit out these objections. And my stepfather, who hated me and I hated him, was actually the one to defend me. And I remember him turning to my mother and saying, Bonnie, what's wrong with you? Why are you so upset about this? the kid just wants to go as a witch for Halloween, just let him go as a witch. (laughs) Well, it didn't end there. Seven or eight years old, he used to go over to my grandmother's house. And one of the things that I would get to do at grandma's was dress up in grandma's clothes. So, you know, bathrobes, maybe a peignoir or two. (laughs) Costume jewelry, Avon and Sarah Coventry. (laughs) And uh, my grandmother... um, My grandmother would, uh, if I wanted a long little house on the prairie type dress, she would take a quilt and wrap it around me and um, secure it with a safety pin and say, now don't tell your mother I let you do this. (laughs) Well, at that age, seven or eight years old, I already had a sense that I was not like other boys. I was, uh, believe it or not, very shy. Uh, around other boys mainly. Terrified of men, all men, um, for reasons. Uh, but I grew up with, with only a violent male role model. And I generalized that to all men. So it's very afraid of men, very afraid of boys, very afraid of rough and tumble play. I was a very stereotypical, effeminate, proto-gay boy. 
verbal, imaginative, but not physically coordinated, not, uh, not a boy's boy. And as I got closer to 10 years old, I began to have what I now recognize looking back sort of proto-romantic feelings about boys. And I knew that I wasn't supposed to have those. That wasn't how a boy was supposed to feel about other boys. Now, this is the early 80s. So there's no talking about this, either at home or in public. That was not done in those days. So there, I didn't have discussions with my mother or with a guidance counselor or with any other adult about any of this stuff. And I know that some of you will recognize what I'm my story in you because my story is not an uncommon one for gay boys. It's not universal, but it is not rare either. There, when you are a child, when when you are a child in that era, you do believe that you are the only person, the only boy on the face of the earth that has this problem. Yes, that is actually what I believed, and that's what every child believes, or believed at that point. I used to go to bed at night um, praying to God that I would wake up in the morning as either a normal boy who liked boy things and didn't have soft feelings about other boys or that I would wake up in a girl's body because I was convinced that I either had a birth defect or God was punishing me or I'd been born bad. I knew that I was bad. This made me wicked. And I did things when I dressed up as a girl, again, seven, eight, maybe nine years old. I would tuck my penis flat in my underwear so that I could see what I was supposed to look like. Okay. And then later, this, uh, the, uh, mm, the urge to dress up as a girl went away for a while until I got to college and started dressing up as Joan Crawford. <laughs> um, that, that went away um, as a fixation. And somewhere between 12 and 13, I came out both to my mother and at school, which was unusual in the 80s. And I remember the conversation with my mother. This is, um, it's interesting to contemplate. I'm not quite sure how to process it. I hate, I hate that I said that, I'm sorry, that, that kind of language. I'm just not sure what to think about it. It was a long conversation. And my mother had, had made extremely anti-gay remarks for several years before I had this conversation with her. So I was quite afraid um, of, of, of what she would do or say, but I felt, I, I did this because I felt compelled. I, I felt that I was lying to people because I was getting to the age where I was going through puberty and people were starting to ask questions like, well, which girls do you like? And I, I, I've always had a hard time lying in that way. So I took the chance. We had a very long conversation, a couple of hours, lots of crying with both of us. And my mother shared some of her fears with me and she said, I was afraid, and I think she was still a little bit afraid of this. She said, I was afraid that I was making you gay because I didn't give you a father. I never met my father. And I didn't give you a good father. And she was talking about my stepfather, who was a violent man. And I reassured her, no, no, you didn't do anything wrong. You didn't do it. You know, you can't make anyone gay. And, you know, well, I now suspect that it had something to do with it. Yeah, yeah, I'm one of those gays, I'm one of those conservative gays who does believe it's very plausible and I think likely that certain parenting practices do have a causative effect, not just a correlation, a causative effect. I can't know this for sure. I can't prove it to you, I can't prove it to myself and I'm willing to change my mind, but I do believe that. And I think it's kind of funny and Freudian to think back on it now. Obviously, my mother was a very abusive woman. I don't speak to her. But even if the home life that she gave me contributed to my homosexuality, I don't consider that a conscious act of abuse. Maybe a, um, 
an outcome. But it wasn't as if my mother set out to do that particular thing. So it's not something I'm going to lay blame on her for. Nevertheless, what I just described to you is the story of being a proto-gay little boy. It's a familiar story to any parent who's had an effeminate son. This is what we used to call, until recently, in 2013, in the medical literature, we called it gender identity disorder. It is today called gender dysphoria. Mm -hmm. What I just described to you, what I went through, would have been diagnosed as gender identity disorder. That is, I just described to you what you are being trained to believe is a trans child. I was a trans girl, right? Right? You know that transing is just transing away the gay. You understand this, yes? It is. 80 to 90 percent of these children grow up to be homosexuals. Because the stereotype of the butch girl and the sissy boy turning out to be gay is true. That's why it's a stereotype, because everybody knows it. Everyone can see it. And even if you're in the 20 or 30 percent of homosexuals who did not have an apparent cross-gender identification, I recognize that you exist. I'm not saying this was your story. I am saying it is a common story. So I had gender identity disorder. And thank God no such thing had been considered the way it is today. Thank God, actually, that I couldn't say this to anyone. I, I'm actually thankful for that feeling of isolation and terror and loneliness, because if the alternative was vocalizing my fears in an era like today, I'd have half my body chopped off. A study from 1991 has resurfaced. <clears throat> I don't know why it's resurfaced, but I'm glad to see it being talked about. It's suggestive. It's a pilot study. It is suggestive, and the authors explicitly say in the study that it is a pilot study and that more work needs to be done, a lot more. But it is very suggestive. And no, no more work was done after this 90, 1991 survey because it wasn't politically possible. So what is this study? Title, Mother of Boys with Mothers of Boys with Gender Identity Disorder, a Comparison of Matched Controls. Here's how it worked. They had two different groups, a group of mothers with boys with gender identity disorder and a group of mothers with the same uh, demographic characteristics, same ages of children, but who did not have gender identity disorder. Um, 16 mothers and sons with GID, 17 mothers of what the study calls normal boys. Yes, normal. Found that 46% of the mothers of boys with gender identity disorder showed diagnosable levels of borderline personality disorder traits. And only 6% of the mothers with normal boys showed signs of borderline personality disorder. So again, 46%. 7% of the mothers of boys who had gender identity disorder had multiple markers of major depressive disorders. Now, here, are, here were the criteria in 1991 in what was then the DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 3R, DSM 3R. We're now up to DSM 5. In 1991, the diagnosis for gender identity disorder, A, a preoccupation with stereotypical female activities and attire, rejection of male and boy games and behavior, B, persistent repudiation of male anatomic structures, such as believing the boy will grow up to be a woman, or that his penis or testicles are disgusting or will disappear. Does that sound familiar to you? C, the boy has not reached puberty. So all those things have to go together, had to go together for those uh, diagnoses. Here were some other findings of this study. <clears throat> Boys who were predisposed to anxiety and who are highly imitative, that is, good mimics. Does that also sound familiar to you? <clears throat> they interact with emotionally unstable mothers and are much more prone to developing gender identity disorder. It also found that mothers with borderline personality disorder 
um, who had boys with gender identity disorder showed marked problems in interpersonal relations, affect control, meaning how they come off, how they present themselves, and psychosis. I also found that mothers of boys with gender identity disorder who scored very high on the depression scale, they showed difficulties in relationships and management of aggression. Mothers of boys with gender identi identity disorder, according to this study, are, quote, vulnerable to transient but not prolonged experiences of depersonalization, brief paranoid experiences, and transient psychotically depressed ideation. Even the half of the mothers in this study who did not hit the diagnosable range, there were nevertheless in those mothers many symptoms that may be of clinical significance and may constitute a subclinical syndrome. Quote from the article. I'll give you a few more. Quote, this is um, element C1, gentlemen. It was also observed that many women had symptoms of a narcissistic personality disorder but this was not systematically assessed in the pilot study. So in addition to finding that more than half of these mothers had symptoms of borderline personality disorder, diagnosable levels, uh, and major depression, they also just happened to observe how many of them had narcissistic personality markers. I'm so surprised. Next quote. Boys with gender identity disorder exhibit chronic suffering that is often expressed directly by them as self-hate. Examples, I hate myself. I don't want to be me. I want to be somebody else. I want to be a girl. They often experience the anguish of feeling lonely and isolated. Next quote, because most are shy and non-disruptive in school, their psychological pain and suffering often go unrecognized by others in their environment. Quick story here. I was in sixth grade. We had a student teacher, Ms. Hogg, H-A-A-G, not H-O-G, not I'm a hog. <laughs> I don't know why I did this. I couldn't answer my teacher when she asked, and I can't answer you now. I can tell you what I remember feeling, which was absolutely nothing. For some reason, I put great big bright red crayon all over my lips like I was wearing lipstick. And I just sat down at my desk and stared into space, feeling disconnected. Looking back on it now, I remember being there. I remember sitting there. I remember seeing Ms. Hogg sit down in front of me. I remember feeling absolutely nothing. No emotion, no personality, no feelings, nothing. It was almost like I was catatonic. Ms. Hogg understood something was troubling me. And she bent down very nicely and she spoke softly to me. And she said, Josh, why did you put that on your mouth? Do you want to talk about something? I said I didn't know, and I didn't know why I did it, and I didn't have anything to talk about. Um, maybe that's familiar to some of you. Next quote. <clears throat> These boys describe themselves. No, this is not the boys. These are the mothers. They describe themselves as compulsively seeking companionship, as prone to intense, emotionally stormy, angry relationships, and as having chronic and intense feelings of loneliness, emptiness, and depression. They tend to make excessive demands on people and feel entitled to do so. Compared to the control group, that is, mothers with normal boys, mothers of sons with gender identity disorder are extremely dependent on their sons for emotional sustenance. They have boundary problems and difficulty separating from their sons. They use intrusive control measures when limit setting and disapprove of their sons' relationships with others. And finally, if you're wondering about this half of mothers in this study who had boys with gender identity disorder but somehow didn't score in the diagnosable range of a personality disorder. Quote, even when the mothers of boys with gender identity disorder did not obtain scores in the borderline range, many of them nevertheless obtained higher and more pathological scores than mothers of normal boys. Unsurprising. And here in Vermont, again, the Essex Westford School District has lots to say about what children should be learning about gender and sex. I got a copy of a letter that was just sent out recently to parents. I'm gonna read a little bit from you.
This is the same, the same school district that we reported on this show a year ago for having the sexually graphic book, Gender Queer, available in the library for kids. And this book includes fully illustrated pictures of fellatio, masturbation, dildos, and vagina slime. Yes, I am quoting from the book for children. It has a picture of a person showing vagina slime on the person's finger while the person's sister says, taste it, taste it. Yeah, yep. Now, now, in sexual education, in the Essex Westford School District, they're moving to inclusive language, quote, Dear fifth grade families and caregivers, it is time for our science health unit about the human body focused on puberty and the human reproductive systems. In an effort to align our curriculum with our equity policy, teachers will be using gender inclusive language throughout this unit. With any differences, we strive to use person first language as best practice. You will see examples of this below. Here are the examples. So they will not say the terms to the children. They will not use the words boy, girl, male, or female. Instead, they will use person who produces sperm in place of boy, male, and male assigned at birth, and person who produces eggs in place of girl, female, and assigned female at birth. So even assigned female at birth, that bullshit, isn't good enough for these people anymore. <laughs> this is from Principal Sarah Jablonski. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for loving my kiddos. You gonna answer my email, witch? <laughs> Here's the kicker at the bottom of the letter. If you are interested in seeing the materials teachers will be using, we will have a binder available in the main office for you to review. So you can't see it online, they won't put it online. You have to physically call on the school like a Victorian caller. Will you announce me to the principal? I'm here to pay a call this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. So you have to physically call at the school and review a paper binder in the main office in front of everyone. This is specifically to stop parents from doing this. That's why. Look at how they look how they do you. All right, we are coming to the end of the show and you're, we're going to ask you to move over after the end of the show over to our spot on Rumble because we've got a Rumble exclusive of Popoli du Mokali. And I want to tell you, we are doing this on purpose. I know and I hate this, but we are nudging you a little bit. We do want you to go over to Rumble a little bit more and we're going to keep nudging you because sooner or later YouTube is going to go. Eh. And not only are we putting Popoli du Mokali, on Rumble exclusively, it's not gonna be here on YouTube, but anything that we can't talk about on YouTube that's too controversial that's gonna get us booted off, we're going over to Rumble too, so there's gonna be more content there. Remember, rumble.com slash C slash disaffected, just the letter C. But we'll give you a little teaser from this week's Popoli de Mokali. So this is about a minute worth of a meeting between President Joe Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris, and- um, You know, she's standing up for her kids. Communities and democratic values. That's what it's all about. And all, all three of you speak so well about why you're doing what you did and why you continue to do it. Look, uh, what the Republican legislature did was shocking, it was undemocratic, and it was um, without any precedent. But you turn it around very quickly. And uh, look, uh, we passed the most significant gun laws that have passed in 30 years, but there's more to do. Um, what happened was that we did, uh, we met background checks and, you know, uh, and legislation, so-called red flag laws. But uh, I signed the most extensive gun legislation in 30 years. So many issues, uh, you've been out front and uh, you understand exactly what it's like. It's just tragic to see what's happening in your state in particular, in your city, but also across the country. And, uh, you know, nothing's guaranteed about democracy. 
So we've got Jesse Jones, Camelia Harris, Corn Pop, and Martin Luther Cringe sitting in a White House living room. That was the most boring ass meeting clip I have ever heard in my entire life. You got three Jack in the Box listening to some animatronic mummy making mouth noises. Where'd I scream at? Chocolate, chocolate chip. See you next week. Watch us on Rumble.